When Lenovo debuted the Chromebook Duet series in 2020, it proved successful, especially as a budget Chromebook that had a 2-in-1 form factor selling for under $250. Borrowing on those foundations, the company came out with the Duet 5 Chromebook, which is the model we're taking a look at today. This model was actually released about a year and a half ago, so it's no longer completely new to the market, but can still be readily available either through Amazon or distributors like Best Buy. Main selling point of the Duet 5 is the much larger screen, this one here measuring 13.3 inches diagonally compared to the 10 inch one from the original that is more importantly now made out of OLED, and so has excellent contrast and true blacks. Really, aside from Samsung, Lenovo is one of the few manufacturers to put AMOLED or OLED on their larger screen devices, so it's great to find it here. And in terms of pricing, they have still kept it relatively competitive. Although it's no longer a budget model, it can be found for around 370 bucks, but often far less if you're shopping again on Amazon or eBay. And that's actually a very good value, again, for an OLED display, which is this gigantic. And comparing it with Samsung's Galaxy tablets, you'll often have to pay at least a couple hundred dollars more for a comparable model. With that being said, aside from the display, there are still a few corners that Lenovo cut to reach this aggressive price point. And one of them would be the keyboard being not fully backlit, which is what we usually see on more premium laptops, even two-in-ones like the Surface. But it still is a very tactile and responsive experience that we'll talk about more later on this video. Also in terms of computing power, this one is using the Qualcomm Snapdragon 7C Gen 2 processor, which is octa-core, and as the name implies, it has has comparable performance to something in the Snapdragon 700 series on mobile devices like smartphones. So you're not quite getting the top of the line performance like an Intel Core i5, but this is still a big boost over the low-end MediaTek chipset found on the original Duet, and more importantly, using an ARM-based processor proves to be extremely energy efficient. Just like on the last ARM Windows laptop that we reviewed, this thing can stretch upwards of 18 to 19 hours on a full charge. That includes watching some YouTube videos, as well as doing some web browsing and document editing here and there. It's a machine that you can charge once and then use throughout several days without having to top it up, and it also has very low power drainage as well when you put the thing to sleep and wake it back up again. It's more or less at the same level, maybe just dropping 1% overnight, which is excellent. It's also touching on one of the ironies of Chrome OS, which is that it started off as a super lightweight operating system, essentially being just a full web browser browser along with a handful of extra utility tools, but through time, Google just added more and more features onto Chrome OS, including support for Android apps, and it's now at the point where if you're looking at slightly less powerful hardware, for instance, some of the older Intel Celeron Chromebooks, they now are a lot slower than they used to be because of all the added software features, and it's become more bloated. Battery life has also deteriorated on a lot of those Intel Chromebooks because it's using more power. And so now, more than ever, having an energy-efficient chip like a Qualcomm Snapdragon ARM chip is making a more dramatic difference. There are two configurations of this model, one which comes with just 4GB of RAM. I would argue that the other 8GB model is really the one that you want to be looking at, especially since they sell for not too far apart, and you'll be able to have a better multitasking experience. Otherwise, we have a pretty traditional 16 by 9 aspect ratio on the screen, so it is rather stretched, and it makes a good content consumption experience, but it's not as boxy as a 4 by 3 aspect ratio like you might find on the actual... Microsoft surfaces that it's trying to imitate. Of course, this is also not the largest tablet that Lenovo makes. They recently made the Tab Extreme, which is a 14.5 inch OLED display Android tablet that's even larger than this thing. But I would say all of Lenovo's tablets more or less have a similar design language, whether it's running on Android or Chrome OS in this case. It also includes the Lenovo Tab P11 Pro. It's also known as the Xiaoxin Tab Pro, although these models have a slightly smaller 11.5 inch OLED screen instead, and you can find the four speakers scattered on the left and the right hand edges. So it does provide a little bit of extra volume and good stereo separation. It's also very clean sounding, although I would argue it's lacking a little bit of bass. We'll do an audio test later on. And like most Chromebooks, it has two USB Type-C ports, also one on each side. 
allowing the 42 watt hour battery to be charged up in around two hours and a half with 30 watt fast charging. You won't find a full size type A port, so if you do want to plug in thumb drives and extra peripherals, you have to use a type C adapter, which thankfully are quite common at least, but it's one of the sacrifices of getting a more thin and lightweight frame. The power key here doesn't have a fingerprint scanner like on the aforementioned P11 Pro, as well as on the Tab Extreme. So you don't have any biometrics for authentication, like face unlock either, unless you want to use a third party accessory, or if you have a Pixel phone paired to your device, but there's none built directly on in. So I would like them to have a fingerprint scanner maybe added to the next generation model. Otherwise, we have just a volume rocker there at the very top, and that is more or less it. You don't even get a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack anymore on this tablet. Now on the very back of the tablet, again, we have this two-tone finish, very reminiscent of Pixel devices and looks clean, I have to say. We have a aluminum unibody at the bottom half, and then the top here actually uses a soft touch rubber finish, which is a little bit more grippy to the touch, along with the Lenovo logo and then the autofocus camera, but there is no LED flash. There's a slight bump on the lens portion, and that is because Lenovo includes their kickstand, which you attach magnetically onto the back and can be removed if you want to use it in this full tablet form. So overall, it feels rather premium and overall weighs in around 2.2 pounds. So not too bad considering the 13.3 inch size, but it's not necessarily the lightest tablet in the world. But holding it for some quick web browsing, maybe some comic reading shouldn't be too problematic, though the bezel sizes on the left and right at least are rather slim. So you may get a little bit of accidental touches unless you're holding it the other way around in which the top and bottom bezels are slightly larger. Once detached from the base, we are entering the tablet mode of Chrome OS, and things like scrolling around and navigation feel generally responsive, including gesture navigation similar to that of modern Android, where we can easily go into multitasking, take a look at open applications. This is an area where Chrome OS has gotten a lot better at, even on hardware that's not the most powerful in the world, where just a few years back when Google released their own Pixel Slate, some of you guys may remember the huge controversy that went down, where even on powerful Core i5 chipsets, there was a lot of lag even when they were scrolling around. It just made the entire thing not very pleasurable to use. So it's great that engineers have buckled down and just really worked hard on that. Now the smoothness of the system doesn't really get in the way of you enjoying and swiping around. Some other standards on here, of course, include Wi-Fi 6, so connectivity has also been very strong. I was consistently getting almost full bars. This model, of course, doesn't come with cellular connectivity, but as long as you're in a Wi-Fi region, it remained locked and had no issues streaming even up to 4K content, which is really only useful if you are externally connecting a monitor, since, again, the display's resolution itself is just Full HD or 1080p. That is one of the things to note where, again, a higher res 2K or 4K panel, of course, would be even better, especially on a larger screen. So it's not necessarily the most razor sharp display, although the colors are just so vibrant that they kind of make you ignore that, especially if you're looking at the device from six inches or a feet away, it doesn't become too noticeable. But it is one thing to keep in mind. And also in terms of refresh rate, that's also an area where maybe in a next generation model they will further improve on. I mean, it's certainly not bad and already feels quite smooth, but it is 60 hertz as opposed to 90 or 120. The detail the detachable keyboard, as aforementioned, locks in very tightly using magnets, and the overall typing experience is excellent. Lenovo does have experience, again, with making ThinkPads as well, so they do a good job in terms of cramming a full-size keyboard in here with excellent travel and feedback. Bottom region here for the trackpad also feels generally responsive enough, even though it's made out of plastic as opposed to glass, again, on more of the ultra-premium machines out there. In general, though, it's a very stable keyboard, especially as a convertible 2-in-1. It doesn't flex. If anything, though, Lenovo's design philosophy, which again is very close to Google's, having a fabric-like texture makes the entire product feel a little bit softer and more fun to use, but it's one of those materials which does require a bit more cleaning as well. It's similar to Alcantara that you can find on, again, Surface products from Microsoft, where if this is constantly being put down on surfaces like coffee tables, you have to make sure it's not too dirty, otherwise it may accidentally scrub onto this. One benefit at least is it does provide good traction when you're setting it down, so it doesn't really slide around. One final note on design would be similar to Microsoft Surface products, keep in mind that the kickstand on the back of the unit requires a little bit of extra space on a desk. That is, compared to a conventional laptop, which the base 
region here would rest on the surface on your lap, you do need to have an additional about four or five inches. Lapability is not quite as strong as a real laptop, but of course you get the advantage of being able to detach it and use it like a true tablet when you need to. Moving into performance, a quick look at the camera first. As aforementioned, it's not going to be to the same extent of what we expect on a smartphone, but it handles the basics like scanning and documents. In fact, Google even has a separate scan tab built into Chrome OS these days. It will try to capture only that region, as you can see there, and keep just that section in a more readable form that's not quite as skewed. And you can also choose to save it as a PDF document if desired. In general, again, it's good enough for some quick document scanning. Don't expect the world, but it will suffice when you're using it in a pinch. Pretty average as far as tablet cameras are concerned. And like most Chromebooks, the web browsing experience is its main bread and butter, which is to say it's every bit as good as on a Windows or Mac OS computer with support for browser extensions that you may want to find and being able to load back pages very quickly and smoothly. And again, although a little bit on the unwieldy side because of how tall it is with this aspect ratio, it definitely is an enjoyable experience if you are using it for scrolling, looking at things like comics. The raw horsepower of the Snapdragon 7C Gen 2, which is clocked up to 2.55 gigahertz on Passmark, by the way, scores a 3,728. Just as reference, some of the lower end Intel Celerons and Pentiums typically get around 2,000 or so on Passmark. And more importantly, this being a truly fanless unit means that it doesn't require any active cooling, so no noise, completely silent, even though again, compared to true flagships like Apple's M1 Silicon or Ryzen 7s, it's still going to be roughly half the performance score. Now here's a quick video test and also what the speakers sound like. Tapping on play. So as aforementioned, it's not bad in terms of the volume and also the clarity and certainly has that good stereo separation, but it is just a little bit on the thin side, which means if you want a lot of bass, well, you're not going to find it on this model unless you're using external speakers or headphones. With that being said, video consumption in general, again, is super enjoyable with fast loading speeds, minimum drop frames, especially in this full HD resolution, and things are still super quick to load and buffer, as well as animations in general when it comes to swiping around feel quite fast and fluid. Now, by the way, this tablet does support a active stylus as well. Any USI pen, in fact, will work just fine. Chrome OS these days is much more than I think most people will give it credit for because a lot of things have changed, including, as aforementioned, the ability to install any regular Android app from the Play Store. So if you're trying to do a little bit of gaming here and there, it is entirely possible, especially since, again, this is using an ARM chip, a Qualcomm Snapdragon, just like on a lot of Android devices, whereas if you're getting an Intel Chromebook, there would be supposedly more emulation happening. Granted, again, the chipset is still not as powerful as on more gaming tier devices with something like a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, if you're looking at titles like PUBG or Asphalt. But for more casual gaming, I think it's still perfectly sufficient on something like this. You can even access remote desktop tools which will get you into a Windows environment as long as your device is connected to the internet. Now if we had to talk about a few cons, I would say in the detached tablet mode, one of the things I think Chrome OS still has to work on, maybe it's optimization with the hardware here. If I turn the display here off and then return to the unit a day later, I may find that the unit has rebooted. But I find that often when I have it connected in the keyboard mode, it's not something that I will usually encounter. So a little bit more of optimization work still has to be done, but the beauty is, again, Chrome OS is consistently getting software updates almost on a daily basis, in fact. Note that this Chromebook will continue receiving OTA updates until June of 2030. So you get more than seven years of continued official support, and even even after that point, you can still leverage all the features, it's just you won't receive any newer updates either. So still plenty of life on there. That is more or less it as far as our longer term look at the Lenovo Duet 5 Chromebook. This is pretty much the largest OLED screen Chromebook currently on the market, and I think this is one that's definitely worth considering if you're looking for one of the better experiences, especially in a Chromebook, when it comes to multimedia and entertainment. Learn more details if interested in the links down below, but for now that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Review. That's been the Lenovo Duet 5 Chromebook.